Hi, everyone, and welcome to another evening of Nerve. We are very glad that you guys can spend your Wednesday night with us again. Um, so first of all, just to introduce ourselves again, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture from Stellenbosch University, and we are Davi, myself, and Siobhan. Siobhan and I will be hosting you this evening, and as always, you can find Davi in the comments. And Nerve aims to bring neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. So we are very excited tonight with having over 100 attendees, which is very, very new and very exciting for us. And you guys can also see our global engagement map thus far. So you can see we've had some engagement from all around the world, um, which we are very, very honored and, and happy about. And I'm very excited also to see how our map next week will look after tonight's event. Um, yeah, so we're going to keep tracking this and keep you guys posted on how we are sort of branching out as NERV. Um, then, as always, we have some exciting announcements. So first off, you guys should really check out Worldwide Neuro. It is a website where you can online find upcoming neuroscience seminars and events and so on. So definitely give that a check out. Um, we were also very excited because they featured this event tonight on Worldwide Neuro. And then second of all, Neuromatch Academy is looking for mentors for their computational neuroscience training event that is happening from the 13th to the 31st of July. So if you are maybe interested in that, please do follow the link here and um, sign up to be a mentor. Then, um, like you have seen now also, we have people from all around and we have a lot of different opinions um, and sort of viewpoints in our audience. So please use respectful and inclusive language. And then again, we encourage you guys to ask questions throughout the talk. So remember to post your questions as you think of them and also to vote for one another's questions. Then we will, we will um, ask the most voted for questions first, the most popular questions. And we will invite you on screen to ask your questions to the presenter yourself. If you don't have a mic or you don't want to ask, then you can just add please ask to your question. And then we will ask on your behalf. However, we do really encourage some online interaction or on-screen interaction between our attendees and our speakers. Um, then if your connection is slow and you are struggling to load the feed, just try to refresh your browser. However, if it does fail and you can't watch the event live, then don't worry, you will be able to stream the event once we are done. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Siobhan, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it is a great privilege to welcome Professor Marika van Vught, who will be our speaker this evening. Uh, Professor van Vught is an assistant professor at the Bernoulli Institute of Mathematics, Computer Science and AI at the University of Groningen. She obtained her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and her postdoc at Princeton University. Professor van Vught's lab focuses on how, when and why we mind wander and investigates the fundamental cognitive operations that underlie meditation and mindfulness. In recent, recent years, Professor van Vught has also started to investigate how interbrain synchrony is involved in social connection in the real life settings of Tibetan monastic debates and dance performances. And with that, I am going to hand over to our speaker. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, joining. Um, this is my very first um, um, online talk, so I'm very excited. So uh, let's see how this is going to go. Um, uh, yeah, so today I want to share um, not um, anything about uh, interbrain synchrony and Tibetan monks, but rather um, uh, maybe a bit more um, conventional uh, work on mind wandering. I'm really fascinated by mind wandering and I think it is maybe a process that's more on everyone's mind these days as we are in this very disruptive situation. And while we might try to re re retain some sense of normalcy by trying to get our work done, if we still have a job, if we're lucky enough to have a job, um, but then our mind might go completely elsewhere, thinking about um, worrying about our family, worrying about the future. And um, this is what is basically mind wandering. So it's also called, referred to as task unrelated thinking. So I'm going to 
say a little bit more about that in a second. But before I'm going to go into that um, and what happens in the brain, how we can um, model it using computational modeling and what that tells us, I want to acknowledge, um, of course, um, the people who did the work, because obviously I didn't do this all by myself. I'm accompanied by um, great colleagues as well as um, students. So um, this is my colleague, uh, Professor Neil Statgen. And then uh, these are um, students and PhD students who have been um, well, working on these kind of projects. So Marta van der Velde, Christina Yin, Marlijn Beste and Stefan Hauser. So um, we'll start with what is mind wandering? I kind of already identified it. So it's, it's referred to as task unrelated thinking. In fact, well, that's the simple story, the complex story I'm not going to bore you with um, because uh, there's a lot of debate about what should qualify as mind wandering, what should not qualify as mind wandering. Um, in a way, it's sort of just thinking about stuff that's um, somewhat unrelated to the main thing that you're doing right now. That's how I define it. So I have a very broad definition of mind wandering. And what I'm really going to talk about uh, tonight is, is when is it beneficial? When is it harmful? Um, and how does that work? And at what moment in time does it occur? Can we find out by looking at somebody's brain when they're mind wandering? And for all of these, uh, we can really use computational uh, models and methods. So I thought it fit very nicely to the um, idea of this um, uh, lecture series, um, because computational modeling and neuroscience together can really help us to address these um, very important questions. So. Um, how can we measure mind wandering? Well, um, we typically uh, do the following, and this, this is really how the, the field got started. You, so you give the recipes as follows, you give somebody boring task, and then, um, well, people have been giving boring tasks in the lab uh, forever. In fact, most of psychology is about uh, doing boring tasks in the lab. But what, what was new when people started to uh, work on mind wandering is that they, um, started to ask, um, introduce self-report questions. Like, what were you thinking about? Were you thinking about the task or about something else? Or was it about the past or the future or the present? And um, then what you can do once you have the answers to that question is you can um, relate what happens in performance, what happens in the brain back to the answers to that question, because you know right before that question, they must have been a mind wandering or their thought pump must have been very busy, um, as you could also call it. So uh, a common task that's used is the sustained attention to response task in this task. Um, people will see um, a, a great number of uh, go stimuli. Um, so in this case, um, participants are told whenever you see an O, press a button. So O, and then you see the person pressing a button and so on and so forth. And then there's a cue and the cue only happens 10% of the time and they're supposed to withhold their response at that time. Um, and um, of course, well, people can easily do this very trivial task. So you do this for a couple of times and then, you know, your mind just goes somewhere else thinking about what you're going to have for dinner um, after this or something, um, something else. Um, and then obviously, uh, when you see an O, well, that's when you're supposed to press the button. So you can do that pretty well automatically. But then when you see a Q, your mind will be just like, mm, okay, um, just press the button. That's my automatic response. And you make an error. Um, so this is how these kind of tasks work. And um, as I said, by combining task performance with what were you, the responses to what were you thinking about, you can really learn about what effects does mind wandering have on task performance. Um, so um, we can uh, just to give you a bit more clear example, this is how such a task looks. So you press the button to the O, to the O, press the button. So it's it's pretty slow. So there's plenty of time to get distracted. So now imagine pressing a button whenever you see an O. And then there's a Q and you're supposed to not press. And then there's more, another O. And so you keep going, keep going. So can you imagine doing this for like an hour? Yay. So then every minute or so, I would ask you like, what were you thinking about? Was it about the task, your performance on the task? 
Were you distracted by the environment? Maybe, you know, a sound of a siren or something. Were you daydreaming um, or maybe completely blank? You have no, absolutely no idea where your mind was. So those are the kind of questions that we tend to ask. But we can ask really any question about people's thoughts. Um, so I will show you the results of what we typically find. But before um, uh, we do that, um, I um, want to get your intuition. So how often do you think people mind wander? Is it 5 to 10% of the time, 20 to 30% of the time, 40 to 50% of the time, or even 80 to 90% of the time? So I'm, I'm not sure how many people have responded at this point. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so we have... Um, some more people voting here. Okay, great. So in the interest of time, um, uh, some, some people are voting uh, by just in the chat window. Um, so in the interest of time, let's um, have a look. So, um, um, Siobhan or Julian, can you show the results of the poll or should I do that myself? Hi, um, I'm unable to show it, unfortunately, but we can read it out. I don't know if I should do it or if you want yep. to do that. I can easily do that. So, yeah. Um, so um, in the poll, we found that nobody thought we mind wandered uh, five to ten percent of the time. So um, um, I would agree that that's also definitely not. Some people thought uh, twenty to thirty percent. We have about fifteen percent of people think that that's the case. Well, actually, the right answer is more like forty to fifty percent of the time. Um, so we have um, also half of you thought that that was the case. So you were you have pretty good intuition, and also quite a few people, like thirty four percent of um, um, I'll uh, think that people might wonder 80 to 90% of the time. So I'd say most of the time, actually, it's more like 40 to 50% of the time. So um, that's um, indeed, that's what the poll says, but let's um, actually show you the data. Um, so actually, we will we'll get to that number in a second, but um, here I'm first going to show you just in general, while well, given that we might wonder about 50% of the time, what's different in, um, uh, in people's, um, in how you perform a task when you might wonder? Well, here we are plotting the difference on the left in accuracy and on the right in response time when you're mind wandering versus on task. Um, so you can see that the um, uh, difference between mind wandering and on task here is negative in accuracy. So that means that you're worse off your accuracy is worse when you're mind wandering than compared to when you're on task. And this is true for both a sustained attention to response task of the type that I just showed you, as well as a different kind of task, like a visual search task. But you find it in pretty much any task. Um, so I've also shown it in a complex working memory task, for example. You also tend to find um, changes in response time, but exactly what kind of changes depends on the task. Uh, so sometimes people get faster and, for example, the sustained attention to response task, that's typically what you would see. Whereas um, in other tasks, people might get slower or more variable. And for example, a visual search task, you tend to see people just becoming slower in, um, um, in this kind of a task. So. Um, both um, response time and accuracy will be affected, but it depends a little bit on um, uh, what kind of task it is, the, the kind of effects that you tend to show. Um, and actually, one of the people in the chat says that yeah, there's individual differences um, in how much people mind wander, and that is certainly true. Um, so. The, what I'm presenting here is obviously averages over a population of predominantly university students in the Netherlands. Um, this is what you find, but you find that some people report mind, being mind wandering um, like 10% of the time, some people 90 and some people 50 and the average is roughly 50, between 40 and 60%. So, um, and obviously these effects on accuracy and response time also have large individual differences. So. Yeah. Um, 
so the effects of mind wandering, uh, as we just showed, often um, you, when you're mind wandering, you perform less on your main task. You tend to have lower accuracy and more variable and slower response time, as I just showed you. But it's not only bad. Actually, sometimes mind wandering is, is quite good. So I, I want to emphasize that several times in this talk, because most of the time people think, oh, mind wandering is bad. And I would say mind wandering is not at all bad um, in general. In fact, I would say it's highly adaptive. Um, it's just that when you do it in the wrong moments, it can be bad. So uh, when you're doing a very critical task, you probably wouldn't want to mind wander. But when you're doing something excruciatingly boring, um, mind wandering is is pretty fine and actually quite efficient um so for example there have been studies that showed that when people mind wander they come up with more creative solutions so one seminal study by ben baird um, asked people to do an unusual user's task after either performing an undemanding task a demanding task just having a rest or no break um, and um, they found that especially when people were doing these undemanding tasks, they had plenty of time to sort of nicely, freely associate and get their creative juices flowing, maybe, as you, uh, if you will. So um, mind wandering is not always bad. And I'm very interested in finding these boundary conditions and when is it bad and when um, is it good? So to answer that question, it's helpful to have a bit more of a... Um, um, a, a precise view of what mind wandering is. Why does mind wandering lead to performance decrement? So to ask that to answer that question, I um, would like to make a computer model of the task or present a computer model of the task because obviously I'm not going to create one on the spot here. Um, and so we're trying to simulate what a human is doing and then we're comparing the human and the computer. That's the logic of making computer models of the task. And the idea here is that if our task is a good model of what a human does, then the task should be able to um, predict pretty well what a person is doing in known data. And the advantage is that then we can also apply it to different situations to unknown data and make new predictions that we can then test. So that's what's cool about um, computer models. And um, to go into that in a little bit more detail, I have a fun movie uh, that we made to explain uh, computer models. So let me show you. Our brains can support a wide variety of activities from cycling to studying French. How is that possible? That's what we're trying to find out. Not only to be able to build intelligent robots and computers who think just like we do, but also to understand brain diseases better so we can help those suffering from brain disorders. Many scientists try to understand how brains work by studying how they react in different situations. We try to simulate the human brain. We build a computer model of how we think the brain works, and then we compare its performance to the performance of real brains. This way, we hope to understand how different brain parts work together. Your brain, for example, has a working memory, a kind of sketch pad for maintaining information temporarily. There is a visual part of the brain where the images from your eyes arrive and a place where sounds coming from your ears are processed. There is also a long-term memory which remembers where you live and who you are, a part that moves your muscles, and there are several other parts, some of which we don't even know yet. But how do all these bits work together? What pieces are there? How do they work? How are they connected? We think you can figure that out by trying to build a copy. We program a computer to have a working memory just like in our own brains and a long-term memory that forgets things at just the same rate as real human memory. And in the computer, we can connect all that. This is how we get simulated brains. You can test these fake brains, but first we test the brains of actual people. For example, by having somebody drive a car and talk at the same time. This is possible even though you do two things at once. But when somebody tries to text as well as drive, things are likely to go wrong. Why? Let's see what our computer brain does. In this model, the eyes are connected to the visual part of the brain, which is connected to working memory, just like the hearing part of the brain. It is possible to talk and look at the road at the same time. But if you're texting while driving, 
the visual brain has to route two streams of visual information to working memory. And that is impossible. If the computer model's performance matches real people's performance, then our model might be similar to how our brains really are. Often, our computer models can already predict which brain regions become more active. This way, we try to find out how the brain works. Try to build it like you think it is, and then check if that squares with our knowledge of the real brain. And if it doesn't, it's back to the drawing board. Okay, there we go. So that's the logic of modeling. So you're using what we know. Um, you're turning that into a computational algorithm and uh, you're piecing it together in uh, the format of a task. Um, and then you make predictions. Um, so very, very simply. Now, of course, um, it's, uh, it, there's lots of different ways of modeling, but the kind of modeling that I'm going to present here is modeling using um, this kind of method that was mentioned in the movie. So we already have, like you could say, prefab model components. So we have a prefab visual system, a prefab motor system, which is really um, based on a lot of what we know about how the visual system works, how much time things take, and so on from previous studies, the same for the motor system, how much how much time does it take you in general to press a button. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we're just putting those things together. And we're assuming two basic things. So first is that mind wandering is predominantly a memory recall process. Um, why is that? Well, you know, you might have noticed that whenever you're thinking, you tend to just um, retrieve memories um, and um, combine those together and the memory, uh, the retrieval of one memory leads to the retrieval of the next memory and so on and so forth. So it's this um, famous thought pump that I already mentioned that tends to generate thoughts. In addition to that, there's work reviewed, for example, by Kalina Kristoff in the paper uh, cited here that suggests that really at, right at the onset of a mind wandering episode, you tend to show, um, to see activation of the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus, which are areas thought to be crucial for memory. Um, Apart from mind wandering, of course, we need to have a model of um, um, the task. So the idea here is that the task is um, something that you direct your attention for here using the famous spotlight metaphor. So your attention is directed to the task stimulus and the task is in competition with the mind wandering process. So the moment the mind wandering gets really interesting, you tend to be move towards the mind wandering. And so this is what you might have experienced in this COVID-19 situation, at least I did. You know, um, while normally I don't have too much trouble concentrating on um, uh, say writing a paper or especially programming is kind of fun. Um, now in the COVID-19 situation, um, these thoughts that, you know, make you worry about say your family or how it's going to go in your country, they tend to take over and uh, become much more attractive than the actual main task that you want to accomplish. Um, even if the main task that you want to accomplish is not aversive at all, at all is, and is in fact relatively interesting. But it's just about the balance between those two. And mind wandering tends to occur, especially after you've been working on a task for a little while, um, you, your sort of motivation to engage with the task just declines in time, kind of like almost any neural mental process sort of start out strong and then it just decays um, following the normal memory decay sort of mechanisms. Um, so using these two very simple principles, we can put together a computational model um, using um, a cognitive architecture, um, uh, kind of like in the little movie that I showed you, which has prefab components of the motor cortex, um, um, imaginal, which is kind of like a working memory, a visual, um, um, a procedural module, which um, helps you to, um, or determine sort of what is gonna happen when, and sort of orchestrate all these components. There's something about goals that obviously influence what's gonna happen when, and then there is a retrieval module, which is like um, episodic memory, sort of all the stuff you know. 
OK, so you have all these prefab modules that you can basically link to each other using things that are called um, production rules. They are basically if-then rules that can interact with these different prefab cognitive components. So you literally uh, write things like, well, if we're in this situation, so um, the start of the thought pump is um, happening whenever my internal goal is getting distracted. And getting distracted can be a goal whenever the internal thoughts of, um, you know, maybe worrying about COVID-19 is more, uh, more active, more attractive in a way than um, working on your paper. So if that's the case, then I'm going to set my goal to being distracted and actually trying to retrieve items from my memory. And then my uh, retrieval module will say, now get me a memory and, um, and so on. So this is, you know, the if part, this is the then part. And um, this is obviously just one part of the model, but you would write a series of these kind of models, kind of like just writing an algorithm of how somebody would do the task. And then you let that algorithm interact with exactly the same task that you give to human participants and you try to predict um, responses and response times and then obviously the crucial thing is um, seeing whether that reproduces the same as what you would see in a real human so you would give it the same task that i just introduced to you where a person sees um, an o for example and then there would be after the moment of the O, the model would be like checking what is the rule that's associated with the O. Um, so you need to check in your memory whenever there's an O, I need to press a button. Whenever there's a Q, I need to not press the button. So you, you know, you see the O, visual module does that. Then there's a bit of a memory retrieval, like what's the rule? And then there's the manual goes into action and presses the button. And then for a while you wait and you have to constantly monitor like where is my attention and if you know you have that monitoring process going on then you should be fine then you keep paying attention but the moment the monitoring process is le less active than um, the thought bump then the thought bump is like yay we're gonna go and um, start to retrieve memories um, which means that then my memory system is very busy retrieving all kinds of thoughts um, maybe the worries about COVID-19. And that means that um, I am no longer going to retrieve this stimulus response mapping. And I will just do my automatic response, which is pressing buttons, which means that whenever I see the queue, I'm going to make an error. So this is just what my model does. Um, and I'm going to try to predict now uh, published data from Michael Mrazek, as well as Bastian and Sukur. Actually, in this presentation, just uh, for time's uh, sake, I'm only going to show you data from Bastian and Sukur. And I want to know whether the predicted data, predicted accuracy and response times and so on, are similar to what we observe in the real world, um, uh, too. Yeah. So let's see. Here is accuracy. So in all the graphs I'm going to present to you in the next few slides, um, I'll show you the data in uh, gray and then the simulation in white. So if the model does a good job, then the white should um, be in the confidence interval of the gray thingy. And you can see the accuracy is not exactly right, but not bad. Um, um, response time is a bit slower um, in the model, but overall it's still in the bulk park and the same uh, for the response time variability. So the model is actually probably a bit more variable than a human would be. Um, but this is basically the behavior that we see. But now the crucial thing, can our model mind wander? Um, how often is the model actually distracted? So. As uh, you guessed um, quite correctly, people are on task about, in this case, 60% of the time. So they're mind wandering about 40% of the time. And actually our model captures this almost perfectly. So here our model can tell us whether it's mind wandering or not. Yay, we have a mind wandering computer. Um, I'm just you know, joking, of course, I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> not sure that this computer is really mind wandering. In fact, it's just, you know, explaining the process of mind wandering, but um, it's always fun to phrase it that way. So we have an introspecting computer model and the computer model can even uh, report to us what it's thinking about. Is it thinking about the future or the past or the present? And the way I did this was that I filled the memory um, um, 
of the model um, with memories that had a label of future, of past, of present. And of course, I can label my memories also with an effective valence and um, uh, check hypotheses about that and so on and so forth. This is just the first, um, first stab at it. And so we have a basic introspecting computer model. Now, what can we do with this? Well, we can start to think about the question, the very important question that I already hinted at is what is different when um, you're just happily mind wandering, thinking about your upcoming dinner versus um, you're completely unable to concentrate on anything because constantly your mind is going towards worries about your job or your family um, or how unable you're to... Um, at doing anything, how nobody likes you. In short, rumination. So rumination in the uh, psychiatric literature is defined as a process of narrowly focused, uncontrolled, repetitive thinking, which is mostly um, self-referential, mostly negative and valence. So how is that different from general mind wandering? It lies at the core of depression, and it, it's different from normal mind wandering according to Kalina Christoph, in that it tends to be very constrained because your mind is not just going anywhere, uh, not in this very freely flowing idea generating way, but it really keeps going in circles around around the same thing. And you can imagine that this is typically not very useful. Um, so how would we model this and what kind of effects would it have on performance? Um, so we can model this um, by increasing the number of memory chunks um, that have a negative valence. So as I said before, we, we the model has a memory and we can see um, at what kind of memories get retrieved. And if we increase the number of memory chunks with negative valence, then obviously the model will think more negative thoughts. Um, but more crucially, why would it be that the model has difficulty um, concentrating it is if once you're recalling something negative that then it's very difficult to switch to some some other thoughts including task related thoughts so if we make uh, the connection say, so to speak with between all the negative memories if we make those very strong um, so that's here called spreading activation that's model speak uh, don't worry about it so if um, the the negative memories are very strongly bound together, then it's very difficult to escape from them. Um, so we can model this and then we can see, um, does it predict data? So to test this, well, to first set the structure of the model, or because of course I can make up any set of negative positive memories. So that's very unconstrained. I wanna have some constraints in my model. So what I thought was, well, what is a good index of the kinds of thoughts that people typically think? Well, so nowadays, um, there's actually an increasing amount of data from um, what people are thinking derived from experience sampling experiments. So what you do in experience sampling experiments is um, you ping people on their, um, on their smartphone and you ask them, what are you thinking right now? Um, tell me. Um, are you thinking something positive or something negative? Are you thinking about the past or the future? Uh, do you have trouble concentrating? What kind of situation are you? So these repeated mini questionnaires are done like 10 times a day for say two weeks. And then they give us an impression of how people are thinking and also how people's thinking differs between healthy and depressed people. So that's what we're uh, using here. So 129 depressed and 212 controls answered this question. And um, we can measure like, well, in general, what do they think? So when we are um, modeling, um, when we're looking at um, the positive thoughts that people have, um, if we're looking at the experience sampling data, um, then this is just a frequency histogram of how often do people report this. And you find that um, the depressed people tend to, the depressed people are blue here, by the way, um, they report much fewer positive thoughts than the healthy people that are in orange. And you can see our model to some extent shows the same kind of trends. It's not numerically the same because, well, um, the, the experience sampling data are really like continuous scores on a questionnaire and the model just has a number of memories that it's retrieving. So it's a different units, but it shows the same kind of pattern. And 
Um, conversely, if we ask people um, how many negative valence thoughts, so sort of thoughts that you don't really like thinking, um, then you find that the healthy people show very few uh, negative thoughts, whereas the depressed people show quite a few. And again, the model is able to reproduce that. So, um, and actually this is quite a staggering difference, I would say, between healthy and depressed people. Um, you can also show them, uh, you can even go into different kinds of moods and find that um, uh, in the experience sampling data, um, you see that um, uh, the healthy people, um, they tend to report much more often um, that they are cheerful and content than the depressed people. And conversely, the depressed people tend to report more being down, insecure and suspicious. And the model is able to show these same individual differences, although the exact spread of the moods is different. Um, yeah, I'm, I can spend more time talking about this, but let's leave that for the questions. Um, so, well, basic structure of our model um, memory structure has been set using these kind of data. Now the question is, what effects does this kind of an effective processing about positive and negative moods and, and valences, what effects does that have on how you perform the task? So let's think back to our famous start task, right, with the O's and Q's the mind mind numbingly boring task. How would a depressed model behave? Well. We know that depressed people um, report that they find it difficult to concentrate and um, uh, are not able to, to ten, tend to not be able to do well on uh, tasks in the lab. Um, so do we see that? Um, well, actually, when we gave the model that we fixed using these experience sampling data, when we gave it the same uh, sort task as the non-depressed uh, model, so to speak, we found indeed that the uh, depressed model had a lower accuracy on the go no go task, um, and there were not there was a hint towards um, it being. Um, well, no, there was really no difference in how often it was distracted. Um, so it's, it looked a bit lower fraction on task, but it was not significant. And um, it looked also like the variability in response time was a bit longer, but um, also that was not significant. So really, it shows a, a difference, but only in accuracy. Now then, the interesting question is, um, do we find this in real humans? So we're now, um, we have conducted a study in real humans, and these are some preliminary data um, from the real humans. Um, testing people that are not fully depressed, but, you know, university students that either tend to have uh, a tendency to ruminate in blue or um, those that are just more healthy in, in yellow. And then we look at how well they do on this uh, SART task. And we find that indeed those people who are um, uh, tend to be ruminators, so they have a tendency to depression, but they might not be clinically depressed. They already show uh, a decline in um, go no go performance, and um, this is especially so after the difference is especially pronounced after a public speaking task, which is a known indicator of social stress. So new empirical data are somewhat in line with the model predictions. And note that the model was not adjusted in any way to predict these data. It was really set by different data set and then making new predictions. So I think this is a cool thing that a model can do. It can make predictions for new situations. Um, so yeah, this is how um, we can think about when does mind wandering go wrong? Um, and why, why is it so disruptive? Well, one idea that we have is that um, mind wandering and becomes disruptive rumination when um, it's really focused on thinking about yourself because um, when you're just thinking about me, myself and I, um, it tends to be a very sort of sticky process. And we measured this in the lab by doing a, a complex working memory task, a very hard task. And in one condition, we asked them to, um, in, the, the, um, in, the, in the task, we asked them to think about words that refer to the self. And the other condition, control condition, they had to just make size judgments about objects. So we predicted that when people were sort of uh, lured into thinking about themselves, that they would have more trouble um, remembering things and that they would be more distracted. Um, 
it would just as a consequence sort of have the self-related kind of ruminative thinking um have that going um uh, and so that would distract them more often from the task and this is exactly what we found um we found that um when you're comparing the control condition here in blue uh, to the self-referential condition, which is here in orange, you can see, and sorry, that's the exact opposite convention from before, but um, so now self-referential, bit more ruminative-like thinking tends to show um, a lower on task and more mental elaboration, probably related to the self. Um, and there was no difference in the other thought categories. They were all pretty low and that's typically what we find. Um, and then also uh, we find that this is the score on the memory task. You find that basically um, when they're doing the control condition, their memory scores are higher than when they're doing the self-referential thinking condition. And uh, moreover, we were able to model this with a, a similar kind of model that I just presented to you, except now applied to a complex working memory task. And we found that um, the model was able to explain this pattern of performance by just assuming that when you're in the self-referential thinking condition, then um, uh, rather than using any leftover time to rehearse memory stimuli extra, you would just elaborate on self-related thoughts and sort of not use that mental space for memory-related rehearsal, but just um, rehearsal of self-related thinking, which is not so useful for your memory task. In fact, it's quite distracting. So that's one theory of how this could work. Um, and um, we also did have done other studies in which we explored this question. So in a sustained attention to response task, our famous boring task, we also could just ask people like, how was the thought that you're thinking about? Was it, um, uh, was it something that you could easily drop and think of something else and move on? Or was it something that was quite subjectively sticky? Um, so actually what you find is that when people say, well, this was um, a sticky thought, I found it difficult to drop it, where you know often the sticky thoughts tend to be about yourself and tend to be the, your worries and concerns. You find also that um, when people think these sticky thoughts, their accuracy on the task is lower. Moreover, you even find that um, people's pupil size responds less to incoming stimulation during the sticky thoughts, which are here in um, dashed lines, compared to when they're thinking about um, non-sticky or neutral thoughts, which are here in the solid and uh, well, dot dashed lines. So there's really significant differences. Um, so we think that, you know, these sticky thoughts make you more internally focused and more disengaged from the tasks that are outside on the screen. Um, so that seems like mind wandering is always bad, but as I said before, it can also be good sometimes. And um, that's when in the case of planning. So actually when we ask people, what are you thinking about? Many of the thoughts unrelated thoughts are about the future and typically people that are um, more optimistic, more positive, tend to think more about the future than those who have um, more negative thoughts. Um, so maybe the task unrelated things about the future are quite helpful. Um, like when you're doing something boring, filling out some forms or so, you might just as well um, also plan how you're gonna go home or um, how you're gonna get your groceries um, tomorrow or things like that. So maybe those reflect planning. So we wanted to really investigate bring, bring planning in the lab, but that's pretty, pretty difficult. Um, so um, what we came up with um, was um, not really asking people these questions because they can be a bit disruptive, but rather um, looking at whether people were planning by um, having them do a task on one side of the screen, but then having a future task already ready on this other side of the screen. So, mm, when people move their eyes to the future task, that should indicate that they're somehow planning to do this task. But of course, that's only relevant when you have a task that requires planning. So we came up with um, so-called um, 
rap, uh, RITL task, a rapid instruction task, learning task, where um, you do need to plan beforehand. So I'm not going to go into the details because it's a bit complex. Um, but basically, this is a task that you, know, you need to put together some sequence of rules on the basis of the words that you can see here. Um, and then we asked, like, how often do people move their eyes to the future task, um, which is most likely reflecting planning? Well, and so what, basically what you find is that people do move their eyes to the upcoming task. And when they do move their eyes, you can see that if you look at the performance on this upcoming task later, um, when, when they're doing that upcoming task, you don't find much of a difference in how well they do the task. Um, so here we see um, in white the cases where they haven't moved their eyes to the upcoming task and in blue the cases where they do, did move their eyes to the upcoming task. So basically not much of a difference, um, but you see them be much faster um, in this upcoming task. That is, they are much faster when um, you, they are planning during a task that's simple, um, like a control or a simple choice response time task. But as soon as the upcoming, the, the current task that you're doing, as soon as that requires more mental resources, like a one back task, then uh, the planning benefits are not so much because it's just very difficult to move away from a task that constantly requires working memory. So um, you can basically benefit future tasks um, um, by already thinking about the future tasks when you're doing a current task, but only when the current task is fairly simple. That's basically that. So this is how we've been trying to bring planning into the lab. But obviously, it's planning is a very complex phenomenon and therefore difficult to bring into the lab. Um, but just to say that, um, and of course, as a caveat, we don't really know that this, this eye movement is exactly reflecting the planning movements because we haven't asked people specifically. But um, it is likely that those two are very correlated. Um, and in fact, it's, it is whatever we find found in people's eyes was also correlated with what people subjectively told us about what they were doing after the task. Um, so this shows you that mind wandering is not always bad and it can sometimes be also quite helpful, um, especially for planning. Uh, now, finally, uh, in the last few minutes of um, my presentation, I want to um, talk to you a little bit about how can we find online what a person is thinking. Um, of course, we can't really read people's brains, um, but um, we can try to see, well, can we find out anything about whether a person is mind wandering or on task? So that's more general um, thing than knowing exactly what a person is thinking about. So can we track mind wandering in the lab? And we have a poll about this, so feel free to um, join the poll. Mm. So um, how can we track mind wandering in the lab? Well, in my lab, as um, you saw um, already, um, we are doing EEG. And um, what's tricky about doing EEG studies is that, um, of course, people don't mind wander in commands. So how do we know when they mind wander? And, and one question or one option to answer that is obviously asking them the question. But you can only ask that question really about once a minute, uh, because otherwise people just go crazy. Uh, they can't concentrate on the actual task. So you still have a very discrete signal. So it'd be so nice if we could actually know on a single trial basis whether a person was paying attention or mind wandering. So um, can EEG help us with that? So we can uh, do the same trick as before. Um, person is sitting um, in front of a computer doing a boring task. And all the while, we're recording their EEG signal. And then we're trying to predict whether they're mind wandering. Um, so we are trying to predict that using machine learning classifiers, because nowadays we're very lucky and um, we have these um, very powerful machine learning algorithm. So how this works is basically um, you show the computer um, many examples of what EEG activity looks like for when a person is paying attention to the task and when they have told us on a thought probe that they were paying attention to the task. So basically, you can assume that the, the last four or five three, four, five uh, trials before that, they were probably on task. We don't really know what happens 10 trials before, but a few trials before, 
we probably can assume that their mental state is the same. If they told us they are mind wandering, then we labeled a few trials before that mind wandering. So in this way, we can collect hundreds of trials in which we know they're either mind wandering or on task. And then we give that to a classifier and um, ask it, well, you know, now learn the mapping between the EEG signal and the label and then tell us for a new um, set of EEG whether uh, a person is mind wandering or on task. And to be sure um, that we weren't catching onto something very task specific, we did this um, uh, machine learning analysis, both on the sustained attention to response task, so the famous one with O's and Q's, except that we did it with words. Um, but uh, same, same principle, go, no, go task, very boring and slow, as well as a visual search task. And the advantage of a visual search task um, is that rather than the, um, the SAR task, which is, well, requires very little perceptual, focus on the perceptual stimuli, um, it's, you know, you only need to pay attention to whether this is an uppercase or a lowercase word, so you barely need to process the stimuli. The visual search task really requires strong um, attention on the visual stimuli. So they are very nice contrasting tasks. So, um, well, we got these samples, we trained the machine learning classifier, um, and we uh, learned the mapping between the EEG activity and the class, classes being mind wandering and on task. We found that support vector machines with a radial basis function were fairly effective at distinguishing between mind wandering and on task. And uh, then we made predictions for new EEG data. So for single trials and so like how well can our uh, classifier predict whether a person is mind wandering or on task. And then I'm very curious what you guys think. Um, what was what would be the classifier's accuracy? So I'm going to check out the poll here and see what you guys thought. Um, so we have here votes. Um, OK. So, ah, still people voting, very good. Okay, cool. So um, what we see is that um, about, yeah, it's changing a bit, but about 18% um, think um, the classifier's accuracy is completely a chance at 50%. Um, about 36% of people think the classifier's accuracy is about 60%, and um, about 45% of people think are more optimistic and uh, make the classifier think the classifier is 80%. Um, okay, so most people actually think the classifier is going to be 80%. Now I have to disappoint you because actually in real life um, the classifier is more like 60%. So these are data from our first paper on this um, by Christina Yin. Um, so here she shows uh, the prediction accuracy um, of the classifier um, for every individual participant. Um, and um, so obviously this is chance. And you can see here already that there's large individual differences. Um, and um, what we're showing here in different colors are different kind of predictions. So on uh, orange, we have a classifier that's trained on the SART task and then also tested on the SART task. Um, we also have a classifier that's trained on the visual search and tested on the visual search. But obviously, we're most interested in a classifier that's trained on SART and then tested on visual search because that should really capture a task independent um, mind wandering process and the opposite visual search uh, predicting SART in blue. So the blue and the purple are the ones that we should pay most attention to. And you can already see that some of them are a chance, but on average, they are above chance. They are like 60% accuracy. So, I mean, it's not easy to predict whether somebody is mind wandering, um, but to some extent it is possible. Um, then you might wonder, how does the computer know that you're mind wandering? So what we actually did in this machine learning uh, study was that we didn't just put in all kinds of um, EEG data. We really went into the literature on mind wandering and looked at what kind of uh, neural signatures are people using to predict mind wandering. And we collected all of those. And that's what you see here in this column. So um, people have been using the P1 um, uh, event-related potential, the 
alpha oscillations, the P3, the N1, um, in these different channels. So the channels are labeled um, um, B7, C21, and so on. There are the biosemi labeling conventions, but basically they, um, the colors here show you where these electrodes are. Um, so you can see, like overall, the whole model is, well, actually a little over 60% accurate. Um, but then if you um, just predict on the basis of individual features, you find that the ones that are most predictive are the alpha oscillations in A10, so in this green channel, the alpha oscillation in uh, C21 is quite predictive, and the um, P3 in A19, so that's this one. So you can see the alpha oscillations are really probably the most predictive of whether your mind wandering, which is quite in line with what we know from the literature, so that's nice. Um, but you can do more cool stuff with machine learning algorithms. And um, for example, you can then ask um, about the um, similarity and differences between mind wandering and other tasks, um, because then you, know, you can look at generalization. So um, what we were curious about is to what extent is mind wandering different from just being in a situation with low task demands, because mind wandering tends to often happen in a case where there are not so many task demands. Also, um, mind wandering tends to occur when you're not so vigilant. So it tends to occur more often towards the end of the task. So what we can do is train a classifier on uh, distinguishing low and high task demands and then seeing whether it could predict mind wandering. Or you can train a classifier on low versus high vigilance, basically the beginning and end of the task, and then seeing can it predict mind wandering. Um, so that's what we did here um, on the left. You can see how the classifiers that are trained on task demands, uh, vigilance, and um, mind wandering self report, how they do in general. So you can see they're all above chance um, using both cross validation, leave one participant out cross validation. Um, so, well, classifiers work. And then the question is do they generalize? And here we find basically. No. Um, so we classify based on task demands. Um, the classifier that, that predicts task demands pretty well is useless at predicting um, mind wandering um, self reports. And uh, the classifier that's ta trained on vigilance is also useless at predicting mind wandering. And this is true for both the visual search task and the SART task. So Really, mind wandering is not the same as um, vigilance or low task demands. It's it's a somewhat different process, and you know we've we've also looked at what neural um, structures uh, seem to be mostly involved in this, and um, it tends to be different kind of um, electrodes that are involved in these different classifiers. So this is how machine learning can really teach us about um, in a data driven way about what are the neural correlates um, of mind wandering. And how does this process work? So um, basically, that leads me to the end of my disc, um, talk today. Um, so we started with the idea that mind wandering is quite pervasive. We do it all, like about half of the time. Um, and sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes it's really also harmful. Um, oh, sorry, I was supposed to say um, can both harm, um, hinder and help task performance. Um, and uh, mind wandering studies can really help us to also understand the cognitive mechanisms underlying depressive rumination. And finally, I ended by showing you how machine learning can really help us to track mind wandering over time. And we're also now working in our lab to try to see whether we can distinguish between healthy and depressive mind wandering using EEG as well. So um, that's it. And I'm curious to answer any questions. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Frau von Furcht. Um, this was definitely very fascinating and I think very applicable to all of our lives. Um, definitely for me, <laughs> that was the case. Um, so I'm now going to invite Siobhan online to quickly run through our top voted questions. Okay. Um, if everyone can just give an indication that you can still hear me in the comments, please. Um, our first question is from Chris Curran. Um, if you're doing a repetitive task, does mind wandering depend more on the frequency or on the duration of the action? 
That is, are you more likely to wonder after doing the same action the fifth time or after three minutes? There will be interactions, mm. of course, just wondering if there was evidence that one is weighted more under certain circumstances. Interesting. Um, I don't know of any research that really has looked into that, and I would expect high individual differences. So um, I think it's probably both. Um, so I can imagine that, well, time obviously plays a role, but the more repetitive it is, the less time you need to go off and, um, and uh, start to think about other stuff. But it would be a great experiment to test out different sort of frequencies and maybe also test individual differences in, in motivation um, to find that out. OK, then our next question is from Shavash. Shivanshu, apologies. If given decision-making power, would you embed, embed mind-wandering ability in robots? Um, yes, totally. So thank you for that question. That's a really cool, interesting question. So should we um, in, um, um, incorporate mind-wandering in a robot? Um, yes, I would totally do that um, because I, as I said, um, I think mind wandering can be quite helpful and healthy in that it might help the robot to, um, when it's not engaged in any critical tasks uh, at that moment, it might help the robot to process recent experiences and recombine its recent experiences and maybe find solutions to upcoming problems. So there's some work in, um, uh, reinforcement learning um, that suggests that um, this kind of mechanism where you're recombining recent experiences um, and weigh that also by the amount of expected reward and the amount of um, expected uncertainty or known uncertainty about um, this information can really help you to adjust to new circumstances because obviously circumstances change and if robots can only do what they always do then they're not very adaptable and reprocessing recent experiences which is what you're doing a lot when you're mind wandering can really help you to um, um, maybe develop sort of um, uh, new ideas so so maybe to make this a bit more concrete so say you have um well you used to have before the lockdown i assume that most of people are still in some kind of lockdown um and they don't really go out very often but you know before the lockdown we probably go to work or somewhere every day and we there be we'd cycle or walk or whatever a particular route and then you know one day um there might be a roadblock so if you then during that day when you're ever you're doing something boring if you reprocess the you know all your paths that you've used in the past to get to work um and recombine these ideas um you might be able to find a new route to get to work that circumvents the roadblock so in this way um such a planning process is, is highly adaptive. And that's obviously just a simple example. But I think the associations that people have noted between mind wandering and creativity suggest that um, this is, is very useful. Um, so the, the, the only tricky thing is that you would need to also then um, uh, give the robot some kind of um, metacognitive process so that it can decide when it can mind wander and when would really not be a good idea because obviously you might want your robot to be quite um, um quite reliable for uh, performing the same task over and over again okay our next question is from dean have you tried to fit an extended drift diffusion or mutual inhibition decision-making model to the performance on these OQ tasks? If you have, how do these models' parameters change when fitted to the mind-wandering and to the on-task trials? Okay, great question. Thank you very much. Um, so for those of you who are not so familiar with the uh, drift diffusion models, so these are um, computational models that describe the decision-making process uh, using uh, a very simple, well, diffusing process as if we you know when we're making a decision, we're sort of slowly accumulating evidence and 
Uh, once we reach a certain amount of evidence, we say, oh, we have enough, we're going to make our decision. So, well, this is actually implemented as um, a stochastic differential equation, and people have used it to explain decision making. I've not personally, um, uh, I think, um, well, definitely not published um, any work uh, on the diffusion model and how that differs between mind wandering and on task, but there's some very nice work by uh, Matthias Mitner who has been um, doing that and uh, also use that then to um, look at the neural correlates of mind wandering versus being on task. Okay. Um, then our next question is from Nita. Um, will Nita be coming on, on screen? Um, I did invite Nita on screen, but it does not seem like they will be coming on screen. So you can ask this question on their behalf. Okay. Um, so Anita asks, I wonder if the model can be used to test causality, inducing mind wandering, perhaps by increasing the weight of non-task goals, then checking if the mood of the model shifts toward the negative. Oh, um, yes, I, well, I'd say so obviously you can um, do anything um, with these kind of models. So you definitely um, switching the um, uh, the balance between mind wandering and on task and um, whether it tends to shift to more negative thoughts or just any thoughts doesn't depend as much on the balance between mind wandering and being on task, um, but really on the contents of the memory. So what's different between my depressed model and my healthy model is just that there are more negative memories um, that are available to retrieve. So you can imagine uh, a, a reason for this difference between healthy and depressed people is that um, there's also, um, it's known that people who are suffering from depression tend to have a negativity bias, which means that our attention gets drawn more by um, negative valence informa negatively valenced information. And so this is why um, you, might they might also have more negatively valence, valence thoughts available to sort of mind wander over, if you will. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Shivanshu um, about the training of the the model. So the model training phase. How um, how is the model trained and on what data? Okay, so. Um, I'm not actually sure what um, model we're referring to because the mind wandering computational model is not really, um, it's, well, it really is not a machine learning model. And so in that sense, it's also not trained on data. It's just um, you write this algorithm and then you um, uh, see, well, does the algorithm produce the kind of behavior that I uh, find in my actual data? And um, if it doesn't, then you either adjust um, parameters such as the decay rate of memories or the number of memories that you have in your model, or you adjust the um, production rules. So these if-then rules that form your algorithm, that constitute your algorithm. And in this way, you put together your model. So there's no training on data phase as such. On the machine learning, obviously, uh, these algorithms do get trained on data. So the machine learning that I use to identify and track mind wandering over time, and that's, well, the data that I've labeled based on whether people say they're mind wandering or um, on task. Okay, um, our next question is actually, I think gonna be quite a long answer. So I'm just gonna skip over to a more technical question and then come back to it. So this one, it's yeah. from Dean again. Um, one of the charts suggested that the model could predict pupil size. How was that done? Ah, no, so actually just to clarify that, um, so um, uh, the, the graph from the pupil size was not related to the model. This was just empirical data. So this was literally like some trials um, people reported having thoughts that were very difficult to disengage from other trials. People reported um, easy to disengage from thoughts and we just looked at their pupil size at that time. Okay, um, then this will be our last question. Um, so I think you might need a bit of time to answer it. Um, this one is from Darby. <laughs> um, Buddha said more than 2,500 years ago, and I quote, and by I, I mean him, do not dwell <laughs> in the past, do not dream of the future, 
concentrate the mind on the present moment. Was he referring to mind wandering? And was his message that mind wandering is mostly negative? I think there was also a study showing something similar. Um, people who focused on task evaluated the experience as happier compared to people who mind wandered. Um, so I was asking for your comments on this as a scientist and a Buddhist philosopher. Mm. Okay, well, I, I'm not sure whether I qualify myself as a Buddhist philosopher, but I am um, a Buddhist practitioner. I, I do dare to, to say that. Um, I, uh, great question, very interesting. Um, I think um, I, as a scientist, I would say that um, still I, I stay with my point that it's not bad to uh, re revisit the past and also to um, um, think about the future. In fact, it's most of the time quite helpful, although I would say that it depends a bit on the situation uh, because I found myself that during this time of COVID-19, not thinking too much about the future was quite helpful for my own mental health. Um, so sometimes it is good to not um, uh, think too much about the future, but obviously we need to have some envisioning of the future because otherwise, say, we would never write a paper um, which, you know, takes many years to do and to um, uh, accomplish. Um, so to get things ha to happen that are not just done on the spot, but take some time, you need to think about the future. And this is helpful. Otherwise, you wouldn't accomplish anything. What I think the Buddha was referring to here is more um, the extent to which the past or the future can be well, maybe sticky to what to the, the extent to which um, we are so wrapped up in the future that we cannot attend to also what's going on in the present. So in terms of my model, I think an optimal state is one in which you can go to your thought palm sometimes, but um, you're you have enough uh, sort of awareness of what's going on in your current task that you know when you need to go back and you can easily just switch back when it's needed. Um, so for example, when you're driving a car, it's not bad to have a conversation, but if this conversation is, is very intense and thereby you sort of miss um, uh, the other car that's driving, um, uh, that's just starting to cross right in front of you, then you have a problem. So um, it, it's really more about the balance between um, your, uh, your ongoing thoughts and um, the, um, the, the current situation and, and are you so trapped in the external thinking and, and from a Buddhist perspective also um, at least from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective which I'm most familiar with typically um, what's thought to be not so healthy is lots of thoughts about what are called hopes and fears because those tend to be non-productive kind of mind wandering you're you're just endlessly sort of simulating future scenarios or, or past scenarios without actually productively making any progress. You're just, you know, dealing with hypothetic, yeah, hy hypothetical situations, eventualities um, without, yeah, moving towards a solution. And then that's not so helpful and it only tends to make you nervous and stressed. Um, so I think also even and just more generally, um, uh, it's a bit of a misunderstanding to, to think that mindfulness has to always be only in the present um, or to be mentally healthy, you have to remain only in the present. I mean, I just talked to told my students last week about the patient HM who was always in the present. So this was the first famous case that told us um, uh, of a, a neuropsychiatric patient whose hippocampus had been re um, removed and he could only um, think about the present. He could no longer remember the past and make new memories. Um, so he would be perennially in the present, but I don't think that's a very um, attractive situation. Like you want to have some memories and you want to have some plans, but you want to be able to flexibly engage and disengage from these plans where needed. You don't want to get trapped in them. And I think that's what's important, not the um, uh, whether it's about the past or the future or the present. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and if we can all give a virtual round of applause 
um, for today's yeah, awesome talk. Thank you very much, um, Marika. That was amazing. Um, and thank you to everyone else for attending. Okay. We really enjoyed thank you very much. sharing this evening with you. Um, remember to follow our page um, so you'll be notified. Um, oh, excuse me. You'll be notified of uh, future events. And if this is your first time attending, please keep an eye out for a survey. Um, we're just trying to um, gather as much data as possible on connections and any connect connectivity issues. And then I just like to give a um, huge thank you to our sponsors, Stellenbosch University and the Biomedic Biomedical Engineering Research Group from Stellenbosch. Um, without them, these events would not be possible. And then we will see you all on the 3rd of June for our next event. Thank you and good night. Okay.